God dag, Stockholm. Alt vel? Det er bra. Trond Nørtland fra Oslo her. I'm not going to do this on Norwegian. <laughs> um, I suspect you might be happy for that. I'm going to explain later on why it's actually good. I am not doing Norwegian, even though you probably understand a lot of Norwegian here. Um, I'm, my name is Trond Nørtland, as I said. That's my uh, actual pronunciation of the name. Um, I, I come from Oslo, as I said, also. And also, I have been doing a lot of talks about modularity for quite a few years now. Uh, probably because I, I, got, I got stuck in a, in a huge monolith. Uh, my second job was working in a huge monolith. Um, and I saw the need for modularity there because we were wading in mud, so to speak. Um, we are actually proud of, of the size of that monolith. And we used that as a uh, recruitment argument. Come, to, come and work with us because we have this huge monolith. It's really cool. <laughs> you wouldn't do that today, no. But, um, Yes, I have been doing those talks, and I have different approaches. Um, but I have been, I've been sort of looking into system thinking lately. So this talk is probably a sort of a, I wouldn't say rehash of the older talks, but uh, I have tweaked, it's tweaked a bit because of that. Just a raise of hands. How many have sort of feel they have some grasp of system thinking? Oh, not bad. So uh, that I'm going to do some one-on-one -on -one, uh, here for those of you who hasn't. Um, because it's about half, that, that's really good. Um, because I think we need that perspective in order to do modularity well. And it's kind of obvious, right? Because you need to, mo the modules are the parts of a bigger system. So th that, that those modules have to work in a bigger setting. So it, it's kind of obvious, but it, I think we tend to forget it. And mostly because we are stuck in a, ma a so-called machine age, as Russell Lakoff, a big uh, system thinker, said. Uh, we come from as machine age thinking. We're thinking that we create machines and we work in machines, but we have to move into what he's called system age or information age, actually. <coughs> um, yes, uh, and I, but when it comes to also system thinking, I find that we focus too much on the technical still, uh, the technical technicality, so to speak. Uh, I feel that the most of the problems that we see with modularity is actually social. Or, or uh, it's all people problems, as our famous consultants once said. And in that sense, I was going to spend some time on a, sp a specific strand of system thinking called social technical systems. Raise of hands again. Who have heard of that term before? Very few hands. That's good. <laughs> so may maybe you can learn something today, hopefully. I'm not going to go too much into it because it gets really theoretical after a while. But uh, at least you, you sort of get the idea, though. And I picked this proverb, actually, to, to illustrate that point. You've probably heard it before, and you probably experienced it, uh, either at home or where we are, that you see that uh, in order to work well together, there has to be some, some fences there, so you can actually work productively together. That it makes you good neighbors. And my association with that term is actually relevant to this. I grew up in the west coast of Norway. Why? I probably shouldn't do this in <laughs> Norwegian. It's a tricky dialect. But I'm, I'm very familiar with these mossy stone fences. And it's really interesting. I, a rural area, I come from a farm, basically, so we had these uh, at the home. And the interesting thing is that they serve different functions. Of course, get rid of the stones is one good one, of course. <laughs> but it's not mainly that. <clears throat> Sorry. It's mostly about, for example, setting a, a, a boundary between my farm and the next farm. Saying this is our land, that is your land, so it's basically that. But it also used for more uh, purposeful, uh, more, more dynamic purpose, if you like. They can use it internally to separate between the sort of the, the cultivated area and uncultivated area. So you don't want your cows eating your crops, for example, right? We also use it for that. So then you put it in for a purpose. So it's not only just to, to sort of a, a hard boundary between us and them, but also internally for a different function. <clears throat> and when it comes to uh, this type of design, uh, I was really inspired by a, a quote by this gentleman, Buckminster Fuller, as an American architect, designer, and system thinker. He said this one. You have to remember that a boundary is a useful fiction. And that goes for systems as well. System doesn't really exist in the world. It, uh, it is really based on our, 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 uh, ourselves as uh, uh, setting that perspective. It's a framing idea. And the same with when we do modularity. We have to remember that this is something that we put in for a reason. It's not just a random set of modules, if you like. And also, that, that gives us uh, 
but as I mentioned, then sort of the uh, the stone fences on the outside and the inside of the farm, there are different constraints, right? The outside is very hard. It's my land. That's your land. Stay out, right? Kind of thing. So that's a governing constraint. No. While the one inside has more of an enabling constraint. You want to enable your you, you develop on the farm to, to sort of prosper, if you like. And I think we under underestimate how hard it is to put those boundaries in. I feel we often haphazardly do this stuff, and we end up with creating bigger problems than we probably had. I remember when we had this huge bonnet, as I mentioned, we tried to, do, to pull out some low-hanging fruits. And they were obvious, some of them. So that's, oh, this is going well, perfect. Building stuff, fine, out. Did it end out. And then we're stuck with something com really complex. Everything is hanging t t together. And if you do that without taking a huge, uh, sort of, uh, the bigger picture, it's really, really, really hard. So the problem is, if, is it still worth doing and stuff? And I want to give some reasons. And those reasons are going to be mostly social, because I think that's where the core is, though. Familiar? <laughs> so I want to start with us as people, as a psychological uh, trick, if you like. It's a way of dealing with complexities and splitting it up. It's just to ignore the, the other stuff so, so we can focus on things, right? Because I, I, I sure can't multitask. When I multitask, I context switch. I'm not sure somebody claimed that I do <laughs> multitasking. I'm not sure if they do. Or if they're just great at multi uh, context switching. Could be, I don't know. So, uh, it's, so, it's about, uh, so my first concern is mostly about uh, sort of understanding bits without sort of have to understand the whole, right? Focusing on the bits. So it's great for problem solving, and it's a main sort of thing we often do when we do uh, meet complexity. We're trying to find these things that we understand and focus on those. And that is related to cognitive load theory, which is a really interesting theory by uh, John Sweller and others. And, uh, and this specifically, it's about learning. And so there was uh, certain aspects that you uh, encounter when you do learning or, or things that you want to focus on. And the idea here is that the working memory is limited both in capacity and in, in, in duration. There's a certain amount of things we can keep in our head at the same time. You've probably heard code fitting in, in, at the size of the head of, of uh, some gentleman. So it could be that fit in your head. But uh, so it is this. Let's just quickly look at some of these. You've got this extraneous cognitive load. And you want to re reduce that as much as you can. When you learn new stuff, if there's stuff that you have to relate to that doesn't give you any new information about the thing you want to learn, that's extraneous. I remember when I did the online uh, talks, that was an extraneous exercise. Oh, will my network stay up? And uh, will they see me? <laughs> and stuff like that. So that's stuff that I shouldn't, be able, I shouldn't need to, to care about that when I do online uh, talks. or do talks in general. Now I don't have to care about that, luckily. I can see faces. That's also good. So that's one thing you want to reduce and reduce that as much as you can. <clears throat> and then, uh, then it's about uh, maximizing the, so the amount of understanding that you have of a new problem, that you can map it into an external, uh, an internal schema that you have. When you, when you encounter something like, oh, this, just, this looks just like, for example, then, you, you, then you're trying to maximize this. Of course, this is a tricky part because you often can create biases, like if you go, this looks like this, and then you assume it is the same, uh, SOA, uh, microservices, some, anyone, right? So it looks the same, but it's not really exactly the same. And then there's this part, and this is where modularity shines. It's the intrinsic uh, cognitive load. When you have a huge system, you want to break it up so you can simplify. That is the multi multitasking thing I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so it's about compartmentalization, that you can, you can safely work on one part, and I ignore the rest. That is uh, what we're doing here. Keep focus, remove irrelevant things. So, the second thing I want to bring up then is scale. Scaling an organization. If you pull in, uh, if, you, if you are in a situation where you grow fast, the easiest thing would be to create new teams, not put more people in the same teams, right? It sounds kind of obvious, but there is a limit to how many people you can put in a team. But people tend to do this anyway. So if you could just add new teams, that would be a lot easier. You can scale faster then. 
<coughs> so, and the third one I want to mention is the coordination cost between these teams. You want to re reduce that as much as possible. You don't want to uh, have work leave your team, for example. If you have to sit and wait for another team to finish something, then you have a high coordination cost. Or if you just want to ask them so you need help, that's enough. And you probably also heard uh, some guy, Jeff Bezos, in this uh, said that communication is terrible. That sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, we have been taught that, oh, we have to be communicate better. We have to be better at this. So we go e even go training to get communicate better, right? And that is actually anti-systemic. That is a signal that there is something deeper that's wrong. If, if you hear that, we need to communicate better. Or, uh, oh, my people is, they have lack of motivation. It's not a signal. There's something wrong. Or there's a lot of politics in the organization. And there's a lot of personal conflicts. There's probably competition between the teams or between people within the team, even maybe. And there's a high number of errors going on. All these stuff are signals that there's something wrong. And it's not wrong with the people. It's the setup, the design, the structure. And that is the, that is, then we get really into that sort of the system thinking ideas, though. The structure is really important. The overall structure. Another one, which is obvious why we need modularity, is the need for speed. If, if teams can work independently of each other, or semi-autonomous, as I like to call them, not autonomous, but semi-autonomous, because if they're autonomous, they are basically a different system and a different company. If you work in the same company, you're not autonomous, you're semi-autonomous. But that will, uh, if you can reduce that coordination cost, you can, able, you, can, you can work faster, basically. Not coding faster, but you can get things in reduction for some faster, because you're not dependent on the yearly release or quarterly release or whatever else. So, time to market. But, and you probably guess where I'm going with this, <laughs> my uh, comment earlier about this huge monolith that we were so proud of. Business agility is often constrained by the technical, sorry. Whoop. It's an arrow coming up there. Mm, just yeah, so uh, basically it's hard to be agile if you have to fight your architecture. So there is that technical aspect of things. We need to break up stuff, make it smaller. Because waiting in mud is probably going to not be a good way of going fast. Right? You all experience that. <clears throat> and then this lovely quote from the Big Wall of Mud paper, I recommend you to read it. It's quite old now, but it's still highly relevant. It says, sadly, architecture has been undervalued for so long that many engineers regard life with the Big Wall of Mud as normal. That's me in the 2000s. <laughs> As I said, even proud of it. Crazy. So the fourth argument I want to bring is that you have to more and more modularize your architecture. <clears throat> Create all these loose coupling, high cohesion things. Again, but it's, again, it's all about minimizing coordination cost. It's not then social coordination cost, but technical coordination cost between the things, elements. <laughs> I also, uh, this is an, a new, fairly new slide, because I come across this just uh, during an interview, I think it was Gene Kim, who had, uh, I don't think he had Carlos, no, it was, uh, he was at a talk by Carlos, Carlos Baldwin. She's an uh, economist, and she wrote uh, a book that I haven't read, probably should have, it's called Design Rules, The Power of uh, Modularity. And what she's uh, claiming there is that it's a, it's a financial force. Because when you have modules, you have more options you can recombine things in your thing in new ways. You wouldn't have that if you have one huge chunk. So it's an economic reason for it. As he actually said that experimentation and recombination is the new game uh, with IT, he said. Which is a good idea. I can see that coming. So just an added bonus there. So uh, this book, probably some, hopefully all of you have read that by now. It's been pushed in every talk I've been to probably in the last uh, years. Uh, but there's one quote I want to pull out, which is that a loosely coupled, well encapsulated architecture is the biggest contributor to IT performance, even larger than test and deployment automation. And that says a lot coming from the people with the door metrics. So there is, I mean, they were focusing on that bit, of course, but it's more to this. And they, luckily, they uh, sort of uh, pointed our finger at that as well. So we have data from them that actually loosely coupled architecture is just, that's a good idea. So we seem to agree that modularity is a good idea, right? There, there are, 
obvious benefits, I mean, just logically, but also we have some data now, by now. But we're still struggling, because it is really, really the hard part, and it's often uh, underestimated how hard that actually is, especially when you come to the core of your domains, because that's where the interesting stuff is happening. And that's also where the people have been working for longest, and now create a coupling between every tiniest bit. Right. So um, the reason why I have a children's party here is actually thanks to Dave Snowden. Uh, he used that as an example of things that, re that is really complex that you can't plan. You can't have a KPIs and, and a plan for a children's party. You think you have. I have kids, had those experiences. Oh, you have this image of a beautiful, fantastic party. The kids come in the door, that, those plans are gone. It's no check. After that, it's just uh, damage control, basically, after that. It's a lovely sign of damage control, but it's, it, your plan wasn't worth a thing. Even the planning wasn't worth much, really. So uh, I think we often think that we can manage complexity with this, com this sort of linear thinking. There's the, there is a good way of doing this. So let's figure out how, what that is and go for that. And then we plan and then we fill the gap because we have a fantastic model we want to end up. And that's reductionistic and linear thinking. It's mechanistic, as I said earlier. Like Eckhoff said, we have to leave that machine age. And it's really hard because we have Probably most of you come from STEM, at least I do. I come from, from uh, a science background. And we are drilled, uh, all, all during school, we have been drilled in mechanic, mechanistic thinking and linear thinking. There is one rule and there's one law, there's na natural laws and everything is predictable. And everything should be. If it isn't, it should be. We just have to research more, right? The, the, the truth is out there, <laughs> so to speak. I'm not sure if you have moved on from Newton's uh, clock, to be honest. So let's look at uh, system thinking then. The one on one thing, and I promised. I think uh, system thinking can help us. Ironically, now I use this illustration, the mech really mechanical illustration, but, I, uh, but I, I, there is a point to this, though. Uh, the thing is that if you think in systems, we have to think in, there's a, there's a, there, it's a framing for us, how we look at things. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think this shows the the interconnectedness between parts. So even though we still think that it's linear and predictable and mechanical, we, forget, we even forget that those parts actually con are connected. So modularity, that is system that posed into our semi-independent uh, parts, hidden behind abstracted interfaces. That's the definition I came across from modularity. So with, with these cogs, they seem to fit well, right? Interconnected. So anyone, uh, I'm not going to ask because it's hard to, to reply here. But uh, you can probably see issues with this illustration, right? Because of this. One thing is that it's a machine model. No, sorry, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the parts change, sorry. The parts that change. We, ex we sort of assume that the parts are stable over time. But they are not. They change all the time. Certainly, if somebody comes up with a brilliant idea, we're going to change this part, have this fantastic cog, and it doesn't fit anymore with the rest. It might fit the neighbor cog, because you probably wouldn't do any changes unless you talk to the neighbors, so to speak. But it probably won't fit the rest. It will treat the re 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 revolutions of the rest or something. Yeah. You see? And these things change all the time. We change the requirements, even changing, changing, uh, changing interfaces. The, the decision that we make changes the, the whole space. Like in introducing that cog is going to change something else, some, some uh, uh, affect and change other uh, parts as well. So change is a normal thing. It's not predictable. So uh, let's deep into a proper definition of a system. This is from Russell Aikoff. Is that a system is a whole that consists of two or more parts that satisfy three conditions. I have to read these, get them right. The behavior of each element affects the behavior of the whole. That is obvious in this illustration, right? One turn and one cog will affect everybody. The behavior of the element and the effects uh, on the whole is in the interdependent. So every part is connected to everything and then affects the whole. There's the, there is no isolated subpart here. And they go further and say that independent subgroups of elements cannot be formed. Which means that if you have one part within a part and that part within that part, they are part of the whole. They are not separate systems. They are part of that whole system. So it's hierarchical. Turtles all the way down. And here is the wonderful Russell Lakoff. And you've probably seen this quote. This is a famous quote of him. 
So this is the effect a system has. A system is never the sum of its parts, it's the product of, product of their interactions. So the mechanical thinking is that every part, if you sum them up, you understand the whole. This is also the scientific way of thinking, or natural sciences to be truthful. There's also, a, there's also a reason why things are that they are, we have, just have to understand it. <clears throat> That's the scientific method, as I say. He also goes further and said, our system is more than the sum of its parts, it's an indiv indivisible whole. And this is really core to why I think modularity fails. It loses its essential properties when it's taken apart. So how does that affect analysis, for example? I bet you all do analysis all the time, or probably less now than you did before because of Agile, but still. You think that the way to understand things is analyzing it. Understanding the parts, then of course you understand the whole. That's obvious, right? That's, we are th that's what we have been taught in school, at least I did natural sciences background. If I just understand how the quark works, I can understand how, how we think. That's the scientific mind, mindset. <clears throat> so the effect of this quote, or what he's saying here, is that analysis is not sufficient. It's, you have to do analysis, yes, sure, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And that's what we do most of the time. So, and that is what often referred to as reductionism. That's when we decompose a system into the separate parts. For example, the green coke here. We look at that coke first, decompose it, explain that part, and then explain the whole. So if you understand that all the cokes there, we understand the whole. That's our normal approach to things. But I, what Akhoff says is that we need synthesis as well. And curiously, that is actually the reverse of analysis. Because what you do then is that you go wide and then you go low. So uh, first you start putting things together. You understand, if, if you're looking at that system, you have to understand what is that part of, what the other system, the, whole, the containing whole of that system. And then you understand that, explain that whole, and then you can start explaining the part. Does that make sense? If you, wanna, if you, wanna, um, if you have a user story saying that this customer wants that because of that, because of this, and that, and you understand that, but you don't understand the connection it has to other things on the same level or, at l or even above. You really don't understand the user, how it works, because you're looking at just a single thing story. Or if you're working on a microservice and you feel like, oh, I understand this microservice, perfect. But you ignore the sort of environment that it's part of or the whole that it's supposed to support, you really, really don't understand the system. You understand parts of the system but you don't I understand the connection it has to rest. And then it loses essential properties, as Eikhoff said. So, and then also he said that an analysis focuses on structure. It reveals how things work. And that's, so what's, we need that, no, 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 no argument there. But synthesis focuses on function. So it reveals, or it reveals how things operate as they do. Why they operate as they do. And I think that is one of the big reasons why modularity fails. There's more reasons I think it fails. And that is actually related to this quote by this woman, Donella H. Meadows. I think it was the first time, that, that, that was my first book on system thinking. Thinking in a system is called, so it's kind of obvious, but it's, it's really recommended. Um, it's not a complete, you don't think you understand system thinking by only reading that book, but it's a start, it's a good start. You, you read about one strand of system thinking. <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge, uh, um, Enterprise, the old system thing, I think. But what she says there is that a system, she has a definition of a system, a set of interrelated elements, so back to that, organized to serve a particular function or to seek a particular goal. Both the function and especially the goal is really interesting here. So another thing I think we miss is that we, we ignore that bit. What's the, what's the intention of the system that we're building? Or that we understand the part that we're building us in that system, which we don't understand the purpose of. <laughs> So, speaking of purpose, it's another book by, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, another book I could recommend. It's uh, Ray Acuff's best, the selection of his writing. What he does there, he's, he creates a sort of a, a topology of systems types based on their purposefulness. I'll take a word. And the first one, uh, first type is called deterministic systems. That's where the parts have no purpose and the whole doesn't have a purpose. Like your, a car mechanistic system. The engine doesn't have a purpose, 
It's, it's not sitting there saying, I want to go there. Or the car doesn't have a purpose. I want to make my owner happy. It doesn't have a purpose. It has a goal. But the purpose is brought on to it by us, or the users of that system. And then it also go further and say that, OK, well, what about animated systems, where the parts don't have a purpose, but the whole has a purpose? Us. My heart doesn't have a purpose, but I, as a person, have a purpose. At least, I want to have a purpose. I can, potentially, to have a purpose. And then you have another type of system called social systems. And now we're really into the social technical thing. Where <clears throat> that's where uh, your team, your company, your community, your country, you are consisting of parts that have purpose, and probably the whole has a purpose as well. The country, maybe not, but your team most likely have a purpose. There's a reason why you're there, working to there. If, no, if not, you're not a system, and you're not uh, a team, to be honest. So that's the, that's the social system. It also goes to say an ecological system, and your country is probably a, a, an example of that, where the parts have a purpose, but the whole doesn't necessarily have a specific purpose. Or humankind, for example, is probably not a good example. We're not going to go into, into detail of this, but I'm, I'm gonna, what I'm going to say is that we're going to focus on the social uh, system here. And I think we often agree that we are working in a social or social technical system, but we treat it as a deterministic system. Go back to what I said earlier. So if you go back to this model, <coughs> the parts have people in it now. And that changes the ball game considerably. Sorry. Because, as I said, uh, the parts change in a, in a sort of a mechanic system. But when we have people in it, people change all the time. One day at work, the next day at work, completely different people. Because they bring with them the, their whole to the work. So if they had, for example, a, a children's party the day before, <laughs> and really exhausted, come to work, that's a different person than was that day before. So we change all the time, continuously. And that, and of course, the, the, the interconnectedness of the, the parts is enormous because the things change all the time. So the, the, the point I want to try to make here is that, that then the parts have purpose, and that change things enormously. I'm just going to quickly go into what, what is often referred to as open systems. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time because it's really complex, and I'm probably going to do it in different talks if you're happy with this. So you can, maybe I can come back next year to talk about open systems. Because people, they are, they are, not, uh, they are not part of that Cog only. They're open to a wider environment. As I said, that person coming to work after that children's party. The wider social system is also affecting the parts in that system, and then also the whole system. And the team. And the team can also be affected by other teams, uh, for strategies from other parts of the, of the company or whatever. So it's, it's really it's what people often call complex, because it's open to the environment. So um, let's go into try to figure out how we can find these parts and how can we identify these modules. Is, is there anything going to help? Because uh, what I've said so far, it sounds like it's impossible. And maybe it is, but there, there are some hints. There are some things that can help us, at least. And that's looking for the natural fractures, so to say, the natural seams, fracture planes. Wonderful for this of uh, geog geographical uh, uh, fractures. Um, Yes, so uh, on, on one way of actually looking at it, if you take the social aspects again, now it's the political fractions. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it's just an example of fractions that happen in, in society, right? People gather around some ideas or some thoughts, and then, of course, this is reference to the January 6th storming of the Congress. So uh, in a complex system, we self-organize around things. There are people that we like to join. There are other people that we, or even actually people we don't like to join. So we saw sort of natural fracture. So how could that fit into our line of business, actually using that as a force? This is what I think Team Topologies does. Another really good book that you should read, all of you. Because what they do there is they identify f four different types of teams. There are the streamline teams, which is the one that works uh, in the business or the, with, the, with, the, with the business problems. They have enabling teams, the teams that go in and help the teams getting better at stuff, like Chinese or cultures or whatever it is. And you have complicated subsystem teams, and you have platform teams, technical, uh, some platform that the other ones are using as a product. 
So if you're interested in working with business problems, you probably would join our Streamaligned team. If you're really interested in cloud and, and, and technical stuff, you probably would gravitate towards the platform team. So there you see there is, you can see there is fractions that sort of, uh, it's an attractor to people to move into different uh, parts of the system. And then of course then, as Conway's love said, creates also uh, a separation in the technical things. So how do we, so traditionally though, how have we, how, how have we done modularity before? Or oh, up until now or whatever. Uh, and I, you probably see this paper quoted a lot by David Parnas from 1972, on the criteria to be used to decompose the system into modules. The title is kind of obvious, <laughs> what it's about. So, but what he says that's really interesting. He proposed, uh, instead of, he argues for this approach though, that one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide such decisions from the others. This, of course, was very inspirational to object orientation and other kind of encapsulation ideas later on. But the thing is that uh, I like this and I've used it a lot myself, but it's an emergent thing. You don't necessarily know beforehand what is uh, difficult design decision or what is a uh, uh, design decision that is likely to change. You have probably some ideas so we can guide you somewhat, but it's mostly emergent, something that happens over time. There's another technique from, from Foot and Yoder again, the big ball of mud paper. There's actually, I think this is from that paper. It's called a sharing layer pattern. And it's inspired by buildings. So, uh, if you look at this illustration, now this is from uh, how buildings learn. So uh, they, uh, I think they used that I'm not sure if they used the illustration in the paper or not, but there are different parts of the building that change at different uh, rates. Right? The site is probably stable when you put the concrete in, the house is there. It's not going to move. The structure is probably also very stable, but less stable than 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 the site, and on and on and on. And in the user sort of end up with the in, in the, in the sort of the interior is probably going to change a lot. So if you use that, you can also uh, say which part is is changing often, and then use that as a sort of a boundary between things. Uh, we can probably see it as code versus uh, versus data. Data changes a lot. Code uh, changes less. Um, there are parts of the code that change more frequently than others, you see. Uh, Im implementations, interfaces, stuff like that. Layers is probably something that you have familiarized yourself with. This is uh, the uh, same, same idea with the by model IT. There are some backend systems that are stable, and then, of course, there are crazy, fancy people on top just doing all the cool work. It's not really necessarily the uh, good approach, but it's one approach. But, but this is also an emergent thing. You don't necessarily know this beforehand. So this is what I call bottom-up, but I think we need more. When I say top-down, uh, it's a bit of a risky term to use because it sounds like there's somebody, some big ivory tower architect who decides it. That's not what I mean. It's back to system thinking. So what I'm saying is if you look at this as a system, look at all the uh, forces that are influencing the system. So it's more of an outside-in perspective, if you like. Yeah, so let me illustrate this point a little bit from my favorite book of all time, Name of the Rose, which also turned into one of my favorite films of all times, and then also maybe even my, fav my most favorite TV series of all time. It's fairly new, that Name of the Rose miniseries in 2019. And when I saw that again, uh, because what the, this TV series does is that it's, it's really true to, to sort of the text. So it actually, he reads pretty much from the pages, almost in certain parts. So this is uh, William of Baskerville and his, his, uh, his novice, Atzo. And they were, they were here searching for um, a hidden room in a library. But the problem is that the library there is a maze. It's really hard to figure out. And they struggle to find this hidden room. And then William here had an epiphany. He ran out of the building and then started looking at it from the outside. So what he said is that, and he argued why, that, why he did that, was that thus God knows the world because he conceived it in his mind, as if from the outside, before it was created. And, he do not, and we do not know its rules because we live inside it and have found it already made. So it's again, for me at least, it's a way of thinking in systems again. Move up, understand the whole before you dwell into the parts. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of techniques uh, which take this approach. Um, now we're back to sort of talks I've done before. 
um, because I argue this is a good, so good idea, but I haven't put them in a system thinking framing before, but it fits perfectly. So of course it could be one of those loads things that we meant the cognitive load just looks just like, but I think it actually is though. And one technique is, is uh, business capability mapping, or business looking at from a business capability perspective. So what I define here as a business capability is a particular ability or cap capacity that a business may possess or exchange to achieve a specific purpose or outcome. A lot of good words in that sentence that triggers my thoughts, line of thoughts anyway. So what you're looking at there is the whole business. What is the business consisting of? What sort of capabilities does it need to run? And it doesn't necessarily mean what sort of products do we sell to the customers, but also what sort of uh, um, the capabilities do we need to run the company even. So it's everything. There's, there's nothing outside of a business capability. Everything in a company has to be part of one uh, business capability. And these are not entities, by the way, so just to get that out. Blah, blah, blah. So there's no, no account capability or customer capability. Or, yeah. So these are seams in the business. When I look at them, I mentioned the sort of diffraction planes. But, it, but these scenes are so much more than technical to take because they take the whole business perspective. So everybody's in here. The people are in here, the information is in here, the processes, the tools, the tech, the systems, everything, or IT systems, everything is in here. So this is synthesis, as I see it, because you move up, you have to see the whole. Of course, there's a Udi Dahan. He's probably well known for his SOA approach and service bus, for those of you who have heard of that. This is a, a Java-based conference. You may not have heard of him, but uh, if you go to uh, like this, uh, uh, the NDC conferences is frequent there. But what he did there, uh, what he has done here, is he's saying that a service, like in a service-oriented architecture, should be based on a business capability. It should own a business capability, or rather, he says, a service is the technical authority for a specific business capability. But that is his definition of what a service is, <clears throat> which means you have a very different, or at least somewhat different approach to service-oriented architecture. Because of that. So how would our business capability map look like? Just an example. <coughs> so if you have an enterprise here, and there's a certain parts of it, there's corporate management, there is product development, delivery, support services, market development, and oversight. Just normal distant number of, of, uh, of uh, capabilities at each level, because this is a, this is a hierarchical level, so it breaks down into different parts. So if you, if you work in contract management, or some parts of contract management, for example, you need to understand you are part of a market development, which is then part of a bigger company. So you do synthesis. And then there, of course, is another famous technique that I've talked about a lot about, this domain-driven design. Uh, this is actually something, that, something good that came out, of, uh, came out of the COVID pandemic. People got bored and had a lot of time on their hands. So say, oh, should we just write up something on GitHub about how we do domain driven design? <laughs> so they did. And this is actually quite useful if you're new to domain driven design. Um, it looks very linear here. So that's why they have changed the illustration to this. <laughs> just to show that this, you don't start with one and then like a waterfall thing. Um, but I think this illustration, it's easier to understand this one. Because what they're showing here is that what often people uh, think of when they hear domain driven design is the code part, number eight. But domain driven design is so much more. Uh, at least it, it tries to cover more, but it's not explicit within it. So uh, if you look at the strategic, the strategic patterns, you go up to number three, for example. But we need even more. So that's, that's, not, that's actually a big discussion on Twitter lately about should um, domain driven design cover more, for example, like the discovery and the alignment of, of the whole, uh, the, the, like the product space. Probably an agreement that it shouldn't because it shouldn't be everything, but it should be connected to that. So, so the process is really nice because it shows that you have to start even there. You have to understand the business model and the user needs. Number one, you discover, then you and sort of you do, for example, event storming to sort of discover the domain. So this is a wonderful, wonderful technique. You should all do a lot and use it. I think it was Dan author like event storm everything. <laughs> it's a really useful technique. And it's, it's that simple for those who haven't used it. The, at least the big picture event storm is really, really simple. Just uh, get all the people in one room or at least the people that have all the good questions and good answers in the same room. And then uh, write post-it notes that shows all the events in your domain and then put them up in a timeline. Simple as that but you can use spend hours and hours on that <laughs> on a huge uh, domain. 
But it's really it's a fast way to share knowledge. And then you may end up with a sort of a long timeline. Imagine there's a lot of post notes there. And then based on that, you can see there is groups of post notes, and then there is uh, probably uh, sorry, uh, post-it -note, post notes. And then maybe there is a post-it note alone, and then there's a lot of post -it notes after that. That could be a single of, maybe there is a divider that is interesting. Maybe that's the difference between that part and that part. Could it be that that's a bound context, which is the term they use for modules in the domain of design, or is it that part? You can also look at how people move around in this guy. If there is a group of people working over here and they are not interested in the stuff that works over there, maybe that's a signal that there is a domain here, a capability or whatever it is. Right. So there's, there's a lot of things, useful things we can get out of our event store. Uh, I'm not going to enter these. I haven't got time today. But uh, you can check out this book. It's a free book. It's a community effort. Okay, I also think it came just before the pandemic. Um, I have two chapters in there, so there's a lot of people who have contributed, contributed to that book. I have one on business capability mapping and one on user story mapping. So two outside input perspective. I've mentioned one of them. The other one is definitely the user. <coughs> but there are other things that I'm, that I'm not going to go into, and that is, for example, from team to polish, you have something called independent service heuristics. Like, for example, could, you, could this module be a SaaS service, for example? Or could this be it se separated out to a separate brand? Uh, could it be, is there a set of product decision that's made here and not there, for example? So there's love, just heuristics. So it's, there are no rules that are just uh, ideas that you can look for. And also, of course, system thinking. I haven't, as I said, I spent some time with system thinking by now, but I haven't got into uh, the details of the techniques yet. But um, the, as a system space, system thinking space is huge. So, you probably could look into soft system methodologies, viable systems model from uh, Beer, idealist design from ACOF, and we have spent way too much time on open system, as I mentioned earlier. And there is a, a specific theory there called open system theory, which builds on what I determined I mentioned earlier, social technical systems, seeing people and tech, tech technology as one. Um, so they're taking this further, and what you're doing is that actually uh, this is basically a, a radical reorg of an organization, where you go from a bureaucracy, sorry, I'm just falling off, uh, <clears throat> where you go from the classical bureaucracy and into uh, in independ semi-independent teams. So you're going from a, a sort of a, a command and control bureaucracy to a sort of a, um, uh, a, f a flatter, if you like, hierarchy of functions. People are not telling anyone well, how to do this stuff here. They are all autonomous teams. They are they're running their own show, if you like. And they are doing that based on the goals that they, are co uh, co that are, that they have set them for themselves for the whole company. So you see here, there, there are the strategic level to use productive work to achieve strategic goals. And then you have, maybe you have another resource and planning level that has managerial goals. And then you are the operational level that has their separate goals, productive work to achieve operational goals. Actually, this technique does, does, does not do any business capability mapping or user story mapping or event storm or whatever. They just base it on these goals and then self-organize around these goals. So that's also a way of doing modularization, right? But you'd actually, you as a community, your company is actually doing this by uh, uh, self-organizing around goals. Uh, sounds far-fetched, maybe, but Microsoft had tried it. They did it uh, in 2006 and sometimes later on. Uh, I mentioned uh, Udita Han earlier, his company, Particular Software, is this, this, uh, building the end service bus. They is not only self-organized on our own stable team, but are on a uh, temporary team. They call it uh, task force. They don't have stable teams at all. There's a problem. Okay, who want to join in fixing this problem? Self-organize. That's what they do. So then also using Conway's law to separate things out. Right. <coughs> So uh, this is, if you go back to that illustration I had earlier about teams, so what we want to do then is make teams more autonomous. And then they need to own more. They can't just be uh, uh, somebody telling them what to do. So they have to own their own data. They have to own their own tools, i.e. Uh, also IT systems that they're working on, and the processes. So it's not, it's not a, uh, when you hear cross-functional teams, you probably hear, oh, we need some front-end developer and a back-end developer and a tester uh, and then product owner and done, done. These teams are larger. They need more. They need everything to run this capability. 
Well, it probably, if you if you s s make if you make similarities to to the Spotify model, it's probably somewhat like a tribe or something. Right? Uh, yes, all the team had to do. I can also mention there is a there is a line of research called social technical congruence. Uh, have somebody heard the term social technical architecture? Probably not, since there was very few who heard the term social technical. Uh, the idea there is that that's, this is a common from domain driven design, actually. And I think it was Nick Tune who came up with the term. I asked him where he got the terms from because it's, he used the term social technical, uh, but he did not have any reference to the historical things. So he actually came up with that term himself. But, he, but the idea there is that you want to have an alignment between the team boundaries and the domain boundaries, that were the bound and context where it comes from domain driven design. So it's the same idea. They should own the whole. They shouldn't be uh, dependent on anybody else. So that's called social technical congruence right, or mirroring. That's a Conway's law again. Um, so I'm coming to a close here. Um, I think emergence can work. And I've, we have probably a lot of examples the way it actually does. When an agile team just goes at it and then, and then uh, figure out what to do and how to build and, and sort of the, the architecture emerges from that team, which is actually part of the, one of the... Uh, uh, principles from Agile, the Agile Manifesto. So it definitely can work, but it, it requires a demanding attention to what you have. And not only refactoring, but also continuous rewriting of the system as you learn new things. I listened to Raphael about Skattetatten earlier. <laughs> so it's the same things though, right? Because at some point you, read, you reach a roof or you provide productivity where you can't get any faster. And then, oh, you have to do a rewrite. And then you do the So you, of course you could continue doing that. That's no problem. Then people do that. Scott Thornton does it also well. But I think the risk, though, if you're doing a modularization of a monolith, like we did back in the 2000s, we started at least. We picked one of the pieces, and we didn't know the effect that would have on the whole. So uh, the first one didn't have any serious effect because it was actually quite isolated already. When we started picking the other stuff, we said, oh, that's going to break that stuff, and that's going to break that stuff. And then you can risk up getting this kind of image, if you're right. You're breaking out and win the pain. So uh, this is with the monoliths, anyone? Like you're doing microservices? Everybody, if you want to develop, if you want to uh, put in uh, Microsoft into production, they have to also align with this and this and this and that microservice, or they have to go into production at the same time. Eh, you're not doing services really and you haven't distributed them only so my my cope is that how do you cope with complexity then <clears throat> what i try to illustrate today is that we need different perspectives we need as many as we can get your hands on basically there's no limit to this so we, uh, as i said we need this top down or outside the impact safety we also need the up up down uh, the the bottom up but we need also look at the business goals what are the user needs and you know as many perspectives as you can get a hands-on as i said and it's not only and that is done an issue i have with domain driven design i must admit is that they focus a lot on this on the domain expert like it's there's one person who knows everything the all-knowing person they do say though that often the domain expert is not one person but actually several and you have to figure out which one to ask for the different purposes or the different things that we're working on <clears throat> but I think the idea is that you should create a team where everybody is turning in. Be it devs, be it testers, be it uh, UX people, UI people, be it product people, be it uh, finance people. I mean, wh whoever needs to run that capability or whatever product part that you're running. So you need a co collaboration between multi-skill team, not just a cross-functional team. So just to follow up on that broken pain, I think we need something like this. We, at least we have to have some ideals where we want to go. We're not saying this is how it's going to look, because that would be futile. That would be the, the plan that I mentioned earlier. And we just walk mindlessly towards that plan. But we need a direction. We need a desirable future that we want to have collectively. And then based on that, we know where we want to go and what we can do, because then we got actionable uh, advice when we're sitting and, oh, should we do this or that? We might have some ideas then, because we have this picture in our head. So we did both. So back to what Eikhoff said. <laughs> he did say some smart things, right? So we need analysis, but we also need synthesis in order to make this work. And as he said, analysis yields knowledge. Synthesis needs understand, yields understanding. But also, of course, uh, if we have this, this cyber future, um, 
We also have to iterate all the time because, as I said, the parts change all the time. So there's no predictability here even. Right? So we have to be aware of that. So we have to continuously, we have to build it into organization that this is the new normal, changing all the time and adapting all the time. So we need to leave the machine age, enter the system age. And I think what I've mentioned earlier, I think open source and technical systems is uh, a really interesting avenue to, to sort of explore. I'm doing that at the moment, I haven't finished, and there's a long way still, but I think there's a lot of, lot of things to, to pick up there. Um, and I think we need this, those multiple perspectives perspective to handle complexity. There's no one way of doing this stuff. And, but semi-autonomous teams, where, where they are in the responsibility of the whole task, is actually a really good approach. And this is from open source and technical system thinking. You know. So, then. We can create good fences that makes the system be more than the sum of its parts. I'm just playing off of uh, Acafer. By understanding the connections and the purposes, we make it, uh, make it the product of their interaction instead. And how do you do that? You working to together collaboratively. There's no one mind. There's a multiple minds that need it to do this. Yes, and with that, I want to say thank you for your attention. Um, before we get into questions, I, I, do I have time? Okay, I just want to show you this though. We are running a, a, a survey. survey. This is our second system design though. So if you want to con contribute to research, this is about, um, I can show you, to go back. It's organizational health and in innovation survey. So we are running it on industrial level. We want to figure out how well are your companies doing this is anonymous, of course, so it's not no telling. Uh, and we want to understand what is how, how uh, have you done any changes? How is that working out? Have you not done any changes to organization? How is that working out? So basically that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>